Mrs. from HUD, uh, Mr. Frank Keating, General Counsel of HUD, and Mr. Michael Janis, General Deputy Assistant Secretary. If you gentlemen please raise your right hands. We solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> Keating, Mr. Janis, we are pleased to have you. Um, your prepared statement will be entered in the record in its entirety. Mr. Keating, uh, as general counsel, you have uh, assisted our new secretary very effectively and ably, and we want to thank you for that in, in uh, uh, cleaning up what has been a multiplicity of very serious problems. Uh, you may proceed any way you choose. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, the Department of Housing and Urban Development appreciates the opportunity to testify here today on the actions it has taken to correct management abuses at the Passaic Housing Authority in New Jersey. As introduced, Mr. Chairman, I'm Frank Keating, HUD General Counsel, and I'm joined today by Michael Janis, General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing at HUD. We are here to discuss the chain of events leading up to the Passaic Housing Authority's problems and how HUD in its role of oversight and monitoring of public housing authorities exercised its responsibilities to ensure that federal housing funds at the authority were and will be properly distributed to the low-income residents it serves. Uh, I have this brief opening statement I'd like to read and request, and you have agreed that my prepared statement from Mr. Janice may be made of the, a part of the record. Mr. Chairman, as Secretary Kemp said to you and your colleagues in previous testimony uh, before this committee, uh, that we will continue to give our full attention to grappling with a legacy of mismanagement at HUD by taking immediate and forceful actions to stem abuses wherever they exist. This effort, which began almost a full year ago, has produced, with the help of the HUD Inspector General, the Congress and your leadership, of course, Mr. Chairman, as well as our own dedicated staff of professionals at the Department H.R. 1, which eliminated structurally flawed programs and strengthened the Secretary's hand in establishing proper management controls, enforcing program requirements, and assuring ethical conduct in the use and administration of all HUD funds. That's been our start. But as the recent revelations involving the Passaic Housing Authority indicate, our cleanup effort is not yet over. But while the Passaic situation demonstrates that we have further to go to uncover all of the abuses involving HUD programs, it also illustrates how important regular oversight of the administrators of those programs is to effective management. The serious problems at the Passaic Housing Authority were revealed through a combination of monitoring activities involving HUD field staff, regular independent audits, and special investigations conducted by the HUD Inspector General. These actions, as our testimony and that of the Inspector General points out, uncovered abuses by the authority staff involving employee compensation, travel expenditures, and mismanagement of the Authority's multi-million dollar modernization program. Our investigations also revealed the possibility that some members of the Board of Commissioners of the Passaic Housing Authority may have willfully permitted these abuses to occur. As a result of these findings, the Department took specific action. On January 22, 1990, the day that the Inspector General audit was issued, HUD issued letters of suspension to several Passaic Housing Authority staff members and commissioners under authority granted in the authority's annual contributions contract with the department. These letters barred those individuals from participating in HUD programs or receiving other federal funds. On the same day the suspension letters were issued, HUD notified the remaining five commissioners that in order for them to retain control of the authority, they were required to take specific remedial actions, including reconstituting the board and hiring a new management team. HUD officials met the next day with the five commissioners to discuss the details of those requirements. When the commissioner showed no willingness to make the necessary corrections, Secretary Kemp seized control of the authority and appointed an interim executive director to manage the day-to-day -day business until a new board is appointed and a new management team is put into place. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I wish to note that although you and your letter of January 31, 1990 invited me and Mr. Janice to testify before this subcommittee on the Passaic matter, specifically requested that I advise you of the status of the department's pending legal action against the authority. I'm unable to discuss the details at this time beyond the face of our complaint, which we filed. 
A hearing on the department's request for injunctive relief is being held Thursday, the day after tomorrow, February 8th, and I do not wish to prejudice the outcome of that lawsuit. However, I will be happy to transmit to the subcommittee a full report of the case following the judge's decision. In addition, a description of the department's oversight of and contractual relationship with PHAs is presented in some detail in our prepared statement. Additionally, Mr. Chairman, I would be more than happy to come back at any time and discuss the specifics of that lawsuit either with the committee at large or with any individual members of the committee. That will be very satisfactory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In addition to the actions to deal with the problems in Passaic, Secretary Camp has created, as noted, a special strike force to help the department determine whether similar management abuses have occurred in other New Jersey PHAs. The strike force will target 20 such PHAs for review over the next several months. This review will be used to determine the extent of the problems where they exist and make recommendations on what further action may be necessary, including those which can be applied nationwide. Mr. Chairman, the actions initiated by Secretary Kemp were critical to stopping abuses and preventing similar problems from happening again. As I've stated, reform at HUD will continue to root out all abuse and structural flaws in HUD programs and to institute proper management systems to ensure the federal housing resources are directed to those most in need. At the same time, however, we believe changes in basic housing policy can help improve the management of public housing. Secretary Kemp considers the development of strong resident management organizations within public housing a vital factor in not only improving the quality of life for residents, but for helping to eliminate management abuses as well. News reports from Passaic suggest that residents may have known of potential abuses, but were afraid to speak out. We believe no such fear will exist where the residents themselves are partners in the management of their neighborhoods and communities, working hand in hand with the PHAs to help restore existing buildings to stop the sale of drugs or to simply institute sound management and prevent abuses by people charged with delivering assistance to those in need. We look forward to the introduction of our HOPE legislative proposal later this month and a full discussion of all of the benefits of its initiatives aimed at improving the delivery of federal assistance to poor people and providing them the means to improve their lives. I might conclude, Mr. Chairman, on this note, as Mr. Adams has indicated, uh, Secretary uh, Kemp requested that the Inspector General broaden this inquiry t beyond the 20 public housing agencies uh, which were mentioned earlier in New Jersey. Uh, he has requested that Mr. Adams expand his audit plan to include a review of other public housing authorities uh, around the country and specifically has requested, as Mr. Adams indicated today, that he contact each of the 10 regional inspectors general have them immediately get with the housing authorities within those regions, the HUD housing authorities and other senior officials, to determine if there are allegations of similar misconduct, and if so, to speedily and fully investigate those allegations. That concludes my uh, statement, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Uh, Janice and I will be more than happy to respond to questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Keating. I appreciate your testimony. And I understand Mr. Janice has no opening statement, but he's ready to very answer much, questions. On January 31 of this year, a few days ago, Secretary Kemp suspended the decontrol program. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yes. That's correct. Would um, either of you care to expand on that as to why that program was suspended? Mr. Mr. Janice? Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's fair to say that the Passaic situation was the straw that broke the decontrol camel's back. We had concerns this summer and we began internally discussing the problems with the decontrol program. We convened a task force of people inside and outside the department <coughs> to begin discussing the program. Uh, when the Passaic situation came to light and it was found that Passaic indeed was decontrolled, we realized indeed we had a serious problem on our hands. The problems with the existing decontrol program stem initially from the indicators that are used to decontrol a PHA. Those indicators, for example, and I think... Decontrol in plain English means that they were given more autonomy and less supervision. That's correct. Okay. And they were given especially more autonomy in the review of documents in the CIAP modernization program. And we saw what they did without supervision. That's correct. The serious weaknesses of the existing decontrol program, I think, initially is that there is no indicator that speaks at all to compliance. 
quite, quite literally a PHA that's doing all the wrong things regulatorily can meet all the performance indicators for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Secondly, the greatest relief in the decontrol program is in the CIEP program review process. Interestingly enough, there's no indicator that measures their progress and performance in CIAP. It is a pass-fail system as is currently structured. It is used to determine whether an agency is troubled as well as its decontrolled. So if an agency passes all seven performance indicators, they're decontrolled. If they fail five out of seven, they're troubled. And somewhere in between are all the rest of the agencies. Another flaw, I think, in the system is that an agency has to apply for this. They have to apply to be a recognized performer or a decontrolled PHA. It seems somewhat of an anomaly to me that if we're going to recognize PHAs, why do we have to create a bureaucratic process where they have to apply simply for recognition? Mm -hmm. Because of these factors, and especially the fact, again, of Passaic bringing it very clearly to our attention, we took immediate action to suspend the program. Now, I would say that there are some features of decontrol which have some continuing appeal. Uh, one of them, frankly, is not the word decontrol. I, I, I do not like the word decontrol. The idea of being able to measure a PHA and make a determination whether or not it is a well-performing PHA versus a very poor-performing PHA, I think is important to do. I think it's important to recognize well-performing PHAs as much as it is to take swift action to deal with problematic PHAs. I think it's also important to have it understood throughout the community of PHAs what we expect in the department as good performance. I think we also must consider indicators that cover the whole realm of performance, and especially the performance area of compliance. So I think there are some aspects of now the former decontrol program that are worthwhile, but we need to make a major overhaul in that program, and we're committed to presenting a program administratively that will be back on board before the end of the fiscal year, which will remedy the defects in the current program. Uh, Mr. Keating, you mentioned in your testimony that 20 public housing authorities have been targeted for review in New Jersey. This, as I understand it, is about a quarter of all the public housing authorities in the state. Isn't that an extraordinarily high proportion to need targeted investigation? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, obviously just because you investigate an entity doesn't necessarily mean they are uh, engaged in misconduct. Uh, it may well be that there are no other Passaics, and I would <coughs> we all hope uh, certainly we all think hope that all so. of us would agree that that would be a, a marvelous uh, state of affairs. However, the, the 20 that have been identified are ones that, as a result of information from outside sources, HUD sources, uh, whispering phone calls, uh, any number of ways to get at information are suggested to be uh, housing authorities that ought to be looked at. So that figure obviously will be winnowed down. But uh, in Telsa's time, as we know, the Inspector General knows for a fact that there aren't problems, it's Secretary Kemp's view that we should examine all of them. Well, we, I, will, we will, Mr. Chairman, include in that some PHAs where there have been no allegations, just to do a sample to assure ourselves that there are no lingering problems. Now, the Secretary appointed what he calls a strike force. That has a fairly ominous tone. Uh, can you explain to us what specifically the responsibility of the strike force is? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, the word strike force were chosen to indicate our concern and our sense of immediate action. You succeeded in, in, yes, in achieving I realize, your goal. Yes, I realize we did. <laughs> Task force has been, I think, perhaps a too often used word in right. government which delineates some, some slowness. So strike force was designed to us, we're going to move quick. It, it had another connotation. It is not an investigatory team. It is an administrative team. Its principal function will be to look at the areas of financial management, especially concentrating on internal controls and other financial management areas. Uh, there will be five teams of people. 
They will visit a housing authority for anywhere from two to three days to do an initial review. If there are findings, they will pursue those findings to a logical conclusion. If there are some serious findings which need the benefit of the work of the Inspector General's office, we will make referrals to that office, et cetera. But it is an administrative, it is, an, it is a management strike force. It is not a strike force of investigators. Mr. Keating, I'd like to ask you a question concerning the legal services problems at Passaic. Uh, the IG says the Public Housing Authority did not comply with federal requirements for the procurement of legal services. Specifically, legal services were obtained without competitive negotiation and without prior written approval from HUD. In addition, payments for legal services were not documented to justify the reasonableness of the costs. Now, uh, I understand that legal services may be required to a much greater extent in some years than in other years. But I find the trend during the three-year audit period rather puzzling. In, um, in 86, um, the attorney was paid $45,603. In 87, $119,371. In 88, $321,354. Seven times as much as he was paid just two years earlier. Uh, in addition, there is a HUD requirement that written approval is necessary for payments over $10,000. That was not adhered to. Uh, $150,000 was paid to the attorney for two arbitration contracts unsupported by proper documentation to justify the reasonableness of the costs. Um, as a distinguished attorney yourself, would you care to comment on Passaic's approach to obtaining legal services? Well, Mr. Chairman, they certainly have been busy legally, and uh, we uh, have taken the position in our complaint that those legal services... Well, they've uh, been busy in other ways, too, because they, they worked for jobs, at least in terms of collecting paychecks for yes. four jobs. It is our view in the complaint that uh, we filed last week that these services <laughs> Uh, were not required and were uh, not bid according to the requirements of the department and the law and were in excess of what uh, the compensation for those services should be. Now, I'm uh, unable at this time to go into depth about those allegations, obviously, because they form a bas the basis for part of our lawsuit to understand. require that the authority seek to recover those funds. Uh, but in the course of our examination of the services provided, as I've noted, we found that they, in our judgment, as alleged in our complaint, were not necessary, were not bid, and were in excess of what should have been paid for similarly situated services. So we may, in fact, see a sweetheart deal with an outside attorney who performed unneeded services and was paid for those at an exorbitant rate. Our allegations are that the money paid, federal funds paid, should not have been paid. And we are intending to recover those funds. All right. Now let me ask the generic question. What assurance do we have that the 3,300 PHAs across the country do not engage in, or some of them at least, do not engage in similar practices of... Uh, obtaining legal services without the provisions that HUD requires, competitive negotiation, written prior, prior written approval. Is there some mechanism in existence today, Mr. Janis or Mr. Keating or Mr. Adams, any of you, that you can assure this subcommittee that the Passaic episode is a unique episode, that the other 3,300 public housing authorities, in fact, have documented that when they go out and obtain legal services, 
they do so on the basis of uh, uh, HUD regulations and provisions. Whichever of you gentlemen wants well, to begin. Mr. Chairman, let me, let me just kick it off and perhaps my colleagues Please. might wish to postscript what I'm saying. But I, I, I don't know if we can make a universal statement that this kind of abuse doesn't occur elsewhere. After this uh, task force review, strike force review in New Jersey is completed, after Mr. Adams' review of other uh, public housing agencies throughout the United States is completed, we hope we have not uncovered similarly situated scandals. Uh, we have a review mechanism within field offices and within regions. We also expect that city administrations, uh, state administrations, the public housing authorities themselves uh, will not engage in conjoint ripping off of the public. But obviously, as alleged in the Passaic situation, that, that appears not to have been the case. Uh, we are much more vigilant on this subject, and in the course of our review of, of uh, a, a another package of reform initiatives, we're going to examine this whole subject. But until the review uh, nationally is completed by uh, Mr. Adams, the only thing I can say is that we are informed that this is a unique situation, and we are informed that the field offices and the regional offices have systems in place to see that this has not or will not occur. Obviously, that was not the case in Passaic, so it could occur elsewhere. Mr. Janis, would you like to add to this? No, no, I think Mr. that's... Mr. Adams? No, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me be sure I understand you what the procedure is that is required of public housing authorities. They must have a competitive negotiation before they hire outside legal counsel. Is that correct? That's correct. And they must obtain prior written approval from HUD. That's correct. If, as I noted, if it's more than $10,000. If it's more than $10,000. So if I'm a public housing authority and uh, my legal requirements are considerable, I go out into the community, there's a competitive negotiation with several respected law firms, and then one is selected and the selection then is submitted to HUD, and HUD provides prior written approval before this law firm is employed. That's the procedure. That is the practice. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Adams, can you tell us now, or will you be able to tell us when you next come, maybe after our mid-February break, um, is the IG's office uh, aware of public housing authorities submitting proposed legal contracts for prior written approval to headquarters or regional offices? Is this, is this a fiction or is this a practice which is honored? I'm not in a position to comment. I believe the submission, if they are, and maybe Mr. Jance would clarify, is not to headquarters. I believe it's to the it's regional field office. office. Field office. Field office. Yes. And does the field office certify to Washington that, in fact, all PHAs which are paying legal fees in excess of $10,000 have gone through this competitive negotiating process? There is no specific. No, there is not. It is assumed that that is something that is done. We do not ask for a specific report on that. Well, would it not be reasonable at this stage, having discovered the Passaic fiasco in terms of obtaining just legal services, that you require a certification from all field officers that they, in fact, have evidence that there was competitive negotiation and that they have provided prior written approval before legal fees in excess of $10,000 are paid. Mr. Chairman, in light of this, I think it would be appropriate for us to get a, a broader communication out to the PHA community also reminding them of the responsibility and so notifying our field offices. Please advise our distinguished secretary that we hope that such a letter will go out. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, soon. the secretary has been busy sending out letters in the course of the last year, and we we applaud those letters. We, uh, <laughs> we appreciate that, and we we uh, certainly appreciate the Congress passing our 50 specific 
reform proposals that we, we requested, but this is something that has come up in the course of, uh, of this audit, and we are, as noted, uh, promptly responding to it, and those and other suggestions will hopefully be a part of our reform measure. Excellent. Um, I just have one uh, <coughs> final question. Um, what was your reaction, Mr. Keating, when, when this quadruple payment uh, case hit your desk? My recommendation was to take the action we took on the day the report was received. Mr. Janis? Same reaction. Astounded. Need Astounded. For, need for immediate action. Need for immediate action, right. By the way, with respect to the legal services issue, may I expand my request to encompass all other outside consulting services? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Like architectural consulting services or engineering services. I mean, for all we know, there are all kinds of sweetheart deals going on all over the country without competitive negotiation, without prior HUD approval. And the ripoff uh, uh, may be going on. Mm -hmm. Congressman Shays. I want to compliment you both for your testimony and for your good work at HUD. And to um, and just ask a, a few questions. Uh, first, Mr. Keating, um, what gives you the authority, uh, excuse me, what gives the Secretary the authority to suspend the operation of a PHA that's in some cases created by the state? Uh, and basically kind of take over control. Uh, Congressman Chase, in the, in the 1937 Housing Act, when this symbiotic, dependent, independent relationship, somewhat crazy quilt, was created, it was uh, expected that the housing authorities would be independent. We would write the checks, they would manage and maintain the facilities which they own. Um, in the contributions contracts which we sign with them and also in the act itself it is provided that if uh, efficiency and economy is not provided if in effect we find that a uh, we believe that an agency is not being run according to the way the taxpayers would expect it to be run we have the authority to go in and in effect take it over to uh, not own the property per se but to manage handle the bank account and, and operate it until such time as the mayor, the council, the governor, whomever might be the appointing authority, uh, puts in a new board uh, following legal action, unfortunately, in some cases, and that board we find to be satisfactory to us. Are you uh, able, in other words, the local public housing authority, though, also controls in, in the state of Connecticut, for instance, uh, state-funded housing? When you go in, it seems to me that that board is removed from both the federal and state. In Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, it was deemed that the, the, the housing PHA in Bridgeport was not handling its affairs properly. And HUD, it's my understanding that HUD basically took over operation and assigned uh, a consultant for a number of years to run that authority. And I guess what I'm trying to say, do, do you preempt the state law? Do you... Uh, Mr. Che is... Uh, I I'm one of the new kids on the block and yeah. came with uh, Secretary uh, Kemp last spring, so I don't know about Bridgeport, but our authority extends to federal funds. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, my colleague, indicates that our control in Bridgeport was only over the federal part of the operation, that we had no legal authority to tell them how to spend or not to spend state funds that they were using for the purpose of housing, housing assistance. But I have no specific knowledge about that particular instance. Okay. Well, it's just, it, I'm just trying to, I'm using my own experiences to try to kind of put everything together. There was, in fact, no executive director. Um, there was this individual who was appointed by the, the housing authority, excuse me, by, by the federal government. So. You know, I'll just have to reconcile that. I guess really what I'd love to be able to reconcile before I'm finished today is, is um, uh, the conflict that may exist between state and federal law uh, to know if, in a sense, uh, because everyone's in charge, no one's in charge. Is it your sense that the, the, the federal law needs to, uh, to be changed, strengthened, or whatever, to make it very clear about accountability? Well, uh, Congressman, I think it's 
probably too premature for, for us to say that at this time because we have, as noted, just begun this uh, review of, of what went on in Passaic, what may have gone on in other public housing agencies well, in New Jersey or throughout then. the country. But, but if I may say this, uh, we are more than willing and will, in fact, uh, come back to you and make recommendations to try and provide for efficiency and accountability. That's, that's certainly what Secretary Kemp wants to do. Now, will that be radical surgery or just uh, minor surgery? I don't know. It's uh, too uh, preliminary to say what that might be. We believe that uh, local control is good to have the responsibility uh, as the Congress had maintained and, and mandated in 1937 that uh, the mayors and the city councils and the states have responsibility for uh, the management of these authorities, uh, that's fine. In the case of Passaic, the, the problem appears to have been that the review process, uh, the accounting process, the uh, enforcement process in making sure that they were in fact uh, uh, acting according to law uh, may have fallen down. But again, as noted by Mr. Adams, uh, these individuals, we allege, uh, denied us information to be able to make those intelligent enforcement and oversight decisions. So uh, there's still a lot of smoke out there, and as soon as uh, that smoke clears, we'll be more than happy to return and make recommendations to the committee if that's your desire. Congressman, a point yes, of clarification. Sure. Under public housing agencies are created under state enabling legislation and not through HUD. They have normally broader enabling legislation than just working directly with HUD. Many of them are involved in state programs, as you mentioned, as well as other local programs. We enter our relationship with the Housing Authority through an annual contribution co contract on specific developments. So when we get into this declaration of breach, indeed you're right, we have a situation where that authority has other responsibilities. They could be state responsibilities, local responsibilities, for which we have no contractual relationship and therefore we cannot affect any supervision of that management. So we can only gain, gain control, gain management over the federally directed you, activity. You, you just really triggered something in my mind in Bridgeport, just for the record. Uh, the state of Connecticut took over the operation of all the state-run facilities, took it away from the local PHA. So the only responsibility of the PHA in Bridgeport right now is in fact federal. So. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have recalled that. When I read through Mr. Kane's um, descriptions, uh, he does not call them illegal acts uh, in, excuse me, in, in the Housing Authority of the City of Passaic's Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program. Uh, his, Mr. Kane's report, uh, which I found very interesting and, and I felt thorough, uh, he talks about them as being deficiencies. Can you um, allay my fears that, that uh, that we won't conclude uh, what I think is almost incomprehensible to conclude, but it seems to me no one's yet said it, is paying one person four jobs to full-time an illegal action on the part of the Housing Authority? Well, Congressman, it, it may or may not be truthfully depending upon state law. In this case, uh, New Jersey law will be looked to uh, by the court to determine whether or not multiple salaries are permitted. It is our view that even if multiple salaries are permitted under New Jersey law, that we had a contract that said they were not to be paid. And that statements made back to us, as noted in previous testimony, that were false uh, may cross that line which requires an investigation other than a civil investigation, namely a criminal investigation as Mr. Adams has indicated. So uh, it, it still is somewhat of a murky area, but even if multiple salaries are permitted under New Jersey state law, we feel we had a contract with those people and that the only salary that was permitted under the law was that salary which we approved and which we understood was to be paid for one person, one job. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, Congresswoman Rupin? I'm not finished. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify this last position, uh, uh, this last issue then it, it, it's my understanding, and, and it seems logical to me, that you have really started to enter this world of local PHAs from a legal standpoint to look at who they are accountable to and to determine whether or not we need to be 
uh, to redefine their responsibilities or redefine who they are in, in essence responsible to. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> Congressman, I, as, uh, as Mr. Adams said, sometimes we are buffeted by uh, you know, twin currents. When things are going uh, uh, well, uh, the cities take responsibility in some cases for all the things that are going well. If the things are not going well, the cities like to argue that HUD's in charge and there's not much we can do. As someone who spent most of his career in law enforcement, I was always puzzled by the fact that in many communities, the law enforcement uh, people didn't want to go into public housing projects and didn't, and didn't want to provide the basic law enforcement services to which those citizens are, are, are entitled. Uh, sort of like they have seceded from the union or something. And oftentimes we would be told, well, you know, that's the public housing agency's responsibility. It is Secretary Kemp's view that the residents are citizens of these communities and states that the public housing stock belongs to these cities and states and that there should be uh, significant levels of public services provided. There obviously, if there is local control, is local responsibility. But we certainly are not going to permit, as a result of this probe, for federal dollars to be misappropriated and to be frittered away because of our inability or unwillingness to follow them. We will not permit that to happen and we intend to make sure it doesn't happen. But there is this, this uh, this, uh, I mentioned, symbiotic relationship. It's a dependent, independent relationship between the public housing authorities and HUD, which we will examine during the course of this reform uh, oversight. Okay. Uh, I'll conclude with just asking you, Mr. Janice, uh, uh, maybe it's better, I'm not sure it's a legal question as it relates to just take a, a, a housing authority in, in my community, in my district, that, or the district I represent, that is being sued for not providing a proper facility. And it seems to me what I heard you say, Mr. Keating, was that it w these are, in fact, owned by the local housing authorities. And yet it's really the, the federal government that is answerable to the conditions there, and that's what confuses me. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the conditions are the responsibility of the, the local housing authority, the responsibility of the community. Now, in a number of federal lawsuits, we have now been brought in and told, in effect, that even though the, the local housing authority owns those properties, even though they select the tenants, even though they maintain them, if there is a pattern of racial discrimination, you, HUD, are writing the checks, therefore you have some uh, responsibility for that conduct. So we are much more vigilant, obviously, if we're going to accept responsibility to accept some uh, participation in decision and control. How far that line is to be drawn obviously remains to be seen, but the courts are beginning uh, to say, well, if you write the checks, you do have some uh, sense of responsibility, certainly in the civil rights area they do. Okay. Mr. Janice, did you want to make a comment on that? Just to underscore what Mr. Keating said, the, the situation when a housing authority gets sued, I think, is a perfect example of the situation that he's laid out in terms of the crazy quilt relationship that we have, and very often, the HUD, the federal government, gets drawn into the suit, even though it is a locally established, locally developed program. And that is something that, as Mr. Keating has said, that we are actively considering and looking at and will consider as part of a, another reform package to include the items that, many of the items that had been addressed with, with the Inspector General. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Chair is very pleased to welcome back to the subcommittee Congressman Schumer. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, let me thank you for the opportunity for those of us who are on the Housing Committee to sit in and again for your continued leadership in this area. Uh, I have a number of questions. I apologize to people coming in late. I had a bill in uh, hearing in Judiciary Committee. Um, my first question is related to, I'd like to follow up on the question Chris Shays asked of uh, Mr. Keating. Um, in terms of criminal violations or in terms of some statute that would prevent this from happening again, uh, couldn't uh, some kind of defrauding the federal government theory be used in terms of potential criminal action against these folks? Well, Congressman, there is a a federal statute that's, that uh, uh, prohibits uh, false statements. Right. Um, that statute may well uh, be looked to uh, for assistance in this particular case, but obviously you have to develop uh, facts 
to support an investigation and or prosecution for a violation. Is, is, As Mr. Adams said in his preliminary uh, statement, uh, all of these matters are being reviewed. And if in the course of uh, his further analysis, uh, there are, are facts developed that should be referred to the U.S. Attorney, they will, they will be referred. No, he also I'm, stated that there was a criminal investigation underway as a right. result of these What I'm trying to find out, uh, based on the, the conversation I heard that you've had with both the Chairman and Chris Shays, is I'm Chairman of the Criminal Justice Committee mm -hmm. uh, on the Judiciary Committee. And the question is, are th is there a void in terms of statutes on the books, or do our general fraud statutes cover these kinds of things? Now, I understand the state issue and the, and the funds, but let's say it can be shown that um, Mr. Uh, Margulio got federal funds from all four, of the, all four of the jobs. The fraud statutes that are on the books are enough to cover those if they can make a case. Is that correct? You don't have to just do false claims. I mean, a false statement. Or is that debatable? It might well be debatable. It really depends on how the facts are developed. I, and I'm, I'm not trying to dodge you. As a, as a former U.S. attorney, I've struggled with a lot of these, these uh, kinds of cases. I think the statutes exist to cover this conduct. Right. Whether the facts will be developed to cover this conduct remains to be seen. Okay. Um, my next question really is either for Mr. Keating or Mr. Janus. Wouldn't it be possible to pass a rule in HUD and why is doesn't one exist now that says that no employee can have two more than two uh, more than one job can have two jobs in other words all over I think even here in Congress and we're not the tightest uh, in terms of passing things that affect us but there's a rule that you can have one employee on two separate federal lines um, why isn't that why doesn't that exist at HUD or does it congressman I believe it, it does exist. With the Passaic situation, we've gone further than what already existed to strengthen it. We have is issued a notice out to public housing agencies and out to all HUD staff, which asks now on the budget for a certification that an individual is not going to be paid more than 100% of their time. It requires also, in addition to the budget certification, a specific certification from the Chairman of the Board of Commissioners that that situation is not occurring. Furthermore, we have this a... This will be in every PHA contract. Every single PHA that submits a budget will be required to state But it hasn't been up things. to now is what we're saying? Not specifically stated, no, sir. Okay. Also, what we are doing is amending the budget form. We're going to amend the budget form to include names in addition to <laughs> titles to be included on the budget form. Mm -hmm. to, to prohibit this Do situation. Do you have some kind of rule in terms of hours that if you're a uh, manager of a PHA, that is a full-time job? Or no. could we have floating around the country people making, not on two jobs, but people who are the heads of their PHAs making $80,000 and then having another private sector job? Would we that be against HUD rules right now? It would be against HUD rules of comparability, which gets us back into the problems with comparability. Comparability should dictate if a person is working full time as a housing authority director, that their salary is based upon a comparable job in the community. Now, if they're working full time as a director, they should have a comparable job full time in the community. However, I mean, they should be paid at the rate of a comparable job Paid at the rate job, of a comparable job. Community. However, right. if you have a director who is working half time as a director, which right. we do in very small sure. agencies. Their comparability should be half time of a job somewhere in the community. Okay. And that, okay. that is the way the system you're should work. You're getting into, I mean, I think you have to do that, but you're getting into areas of elasticity, I would say. Uh, kind way to say it. Um, how do you then and I guess this really, if with the chairman's, is it all right to ask Mr. Adams questions on this too? I mean, how do you audit this kind of thing? They should have documentation by which they establish the local comparability of their salary. In the contract the, originally. No, not in the contract. It's on an ongoing basis if they are going to upgrade the salary. How, how do you determine that? I mean, what if they find some fella? Oh, John Smith down over in uh, the next township. He works for some builder and he works part-time and he's making $81,000 a year. 
Would that be allowed? Let's say they... Well, I think the, the, the judgment of the auditor comes into play as he sees something, and if he thinks it's not appropriate or unreasonable, then we will question that and challenge okay. it. But the auditors haven't been that much on top of these things. No, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in our situation, we do not personally audit. Those are done by independent public accountants. Uh, they, are sh they should be checking those things, and we monitor their work as we go through. Okay, through the because process. I think all of us find it rather incredulously incredulous that someone with all these jobs was not just one year, but three years on the payroll, and that relates to my next question, or series of questions, namely under the rubric: How widespread is this? How can we be sure it's not Paseg, uh, and uh, well, Paseg is really the one we're talking about here, and not 20 others? And I'm sure you've been asked the question. You haven't come across it in any others as of yet. Is that correct? We have seen no indications that it's any okay. kind of a widespread issue. And if you've been asked issue. the question, you can just answer briefly and say, I've been asked that because I came in late. Why do you think this happened in New Jersey? I mean, we've heard all sorts of problems with the HUD office in New York, which oversees, which is in the chain of command in New Jersey. Uh, no, I'm, this is an issue where, unfortunately, New York and New Jersey are very much linked, uh, Marge. Um, I, was, was the oversight there any worse uh, in either the Newark region, in the Newark office or in the larger New York office? Um, con Congressman, as part of the strike force, we are going to be looking at the activities of our Newark office. In preliminary review of what the Newark office did, I would say that they probably followed what was standard operating procedure. Um, I, I cannot find That's at this point. That's not very comforting. No, no. It, but there, there are two things that, that did happen in the process. One was that the Newark staff did identify to the IG's office. You say that, you know, you're going to have a rush of people applying to be managers of PHAs. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't want to suggest that the, that the Passaic is standard operating procedure. But the Newark staff helped identify Passaic as a potential problem and directed the IG there. The Newark office did also issue out on its own to New Jersey PHAs the requirement of a certification that the PHAs understood that you couldn't pay any more than 100% for a job. That was done in October of last year. So the Newark, based upon very preliminary information, the Newark staff was involved in a Norman normal monitoring process had identified that there were concerns as Mr. Adams testified before in reviewing their modernization program there was some indication of some double funding potentially of modernization jobs to the larger question of did they do everything they could have done did they do it as fast as they could have did the system work as well as it should have I would give a PS the system didn't work as well as it should have we should have been able as a system to take quicker action when we knew this happened. We will be looking at ways to do that better. But to say, did Newark do everything it could have done, the strike force will be taking a look at it. But my specific question was, do you think the controls in Newark and in the New York region, or the, whatever should be done to avoid this from happening, was it any weaker than in other parts of the country? I, no, sir. I don't have not. any indication now that okay. things were running substantially different in Newark or New York than in any other part of Let the country. Let me ask you, the, uh, which I guess is really the $64,000 question, what kind of assurance do we have that this isn't happening in other parts of the country, in other PHAs, et cetera? <clears throat> have what, you, what? before this came out, done a thorough audit of, I, I, I know you mentioned you're doing 35 cities right now, and you've done a few, but... <laughs> Given what you've said, it seems to me the odds are you're going to find other instances of what happened in Passaic in other parts of the country. A couple of responses. One, prospectively, from this point on, with our new policy, I would hope through that we would be able to catch anybody who was doing this. And looking back, the Inspector General's office has been auditing and investigating PHAs for a long time, and they have a history of that <coughs> review. And perhaps I could direct it to Mr. Adams in terms to have Mr. of other Adams occurrences. Augment your answer. In response to an earlier question, Mr. Schumer, I did point out that we have done some preliminary checking of other regions uh, through our staff. We have not found indications of comparable right. but situations. But you've done just a few, right? Uh, it was told to me, and it was secondhand, of yeah. course, that you've done, you've audited a few areas, have not found it. Now you're having an air, uh, something, a, a more general audit of 35 areas, right? Uh, well, we've done 35 uh, CAP programs uh, in locations. Out of how many 
There's uh, 3,100 approximate okay. public housing authorities. So and we're the doing some odds are reviews. somewhere nestled away this is happening in other places, given Possibly. the fact that, uh, given the fact that one, uh, the rules aren't that tightly drawn. Second, the auditing process didn't see, or let Passe get away with this for a while. That's fair to That's say. Correct. Okay. You might just bear in mind that among those 3,100, there are many very small Little public ones. housing authorities right. out there, so there's not much of an opportunity yeah, among Less than those. one job, we'd hope, in some of them, <laughs> yes. of them, so this wouldn't Mr. happen. Mr. Schumer, if I may Go say, ahead, as, a, as a, really a postscript to what Mr. Adams said, uh, previously he noted that, and this is one of the difficulties of developing a case like this, that when the evidence was requested uh, to confirm that there were not multiple jobs, the materials that were provided to support uh, the authorities view that there were not uh, uh, duplicated jobs was false fabricated right uh, so that I mean that's our allegation that's a I understand. obviously part of the that the relates lawsuit. to my next question which is the system of these PHAs uh, and how they work was there and I don't know how deeply you're into this yet but how much evidence was there of sort of a political involvement uh, with the PHAs was Mr. and if this question has been asked, cut me off, uh, was Mr. Margulio very active in his community politically? I mean, are we having a situation where uh, there are professional managers being hired or were we having a situation where this seems to be regarded particularly in smaller cities uh, uh, as sort of a political plum? Well, l let me say first on the, on the subject of uh, Passaic that inasmuch as our, our case goes to trial on the uh, preliminary injunction on Thursday, I think it would be best if we didn't get into the specifics of Passaic at this time. Okay. I would defer to Mr. Janis to uh, discuss the subject of uh, political involvement. Can you involvement say without, without jeopardizing your case in any way whether there was political involvement in Passaic? Well, the, the I mean, process of selecting... Uh, housing authority uh, commissioners by the state or the mayor uh, or in, as that's many, not what I mean, I mean that's by a political polit process no 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 that's not what I mean what I mean was well it's it is it is uh, was this person someone who had no experience in in housing before uh, who happened to be active politically with someone <laughs> who was then plucked into this high job now that in a sense you know, you might find someone in that situation doing a very good job, but I'm trying to figure out if we're going to have the situation where people who are heads of PHAs, and again, I say it particularly in smaller areas where there is would be less scrutiny, uh, this being regarded more as a political plum than a managerial job. I do not know Mr. Marguglio's specific background. He has been the executive director, however, for a number of years. Okay. But I, I do not know what... He did specifically. Mr. Adams, do you have any recollection of that? I can amplify that only slightly. I, I am told by staff that he was there in something in excess of 20 years. Okay. Yeah, so. no, then his recent appointment, that's how, he got, that's how he was able to do each of these jobs in a few hours, I guess, <laughs> after all that experience. Um, okay. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, um, I would... Um, assume from Mr. Schumer's line of questioning, particularly with respect to uh, uh, his interest uh, in expanding the uh, scope of the uh, audits and even the, the actions of strike force, that he uh, would endorse my request, which I have put in form of a letter to um, Mr. Kemp, Secretary Kemp, and have expressed here earlier in the, the hearing my, my interest in this. I. Um, heard Mr. Keating in his opening statement allude to um, expanding the IG's audits, and I don't know whether that was a, a response to my request, but I would suggest that I'd want something more structured. Uh, even if you expand the audits and call it a strike force, that might be helpful, but, uh, but the spot check is important, and I don't know if Mr. Janice wants to respond, but I, I do sense uh, some reticence on the part of uh, the staff uh, to complying with this request, and yet I think everything that we've heard here today argues in favor of it. And Mr. Schumer, again, uh, Chuck, you did not hear my, um, my reference to being a, a battle-scarred veteran of the Savings and Loan Wars, uh, and we don't 
want to see something else blow up in our face with that faces without uh, being able to say we took all prudent overt action before the situation worsened and I think here we have clear evidence that um, if we have such tenuous financial internal controls which is what I'm hearing you say it almost sounds to me at least in the New York New Jersey area if not in other regionals regions of the country that we already have what sounds like decontrol uh, in terms of the, uh, de well, in terms of uh, the lack of of, um, of checks and balances that we have here. We, we've heard uh, Mr. Janus uh, concede that there have been relatively few auditing controls and checks and balances, at least in this particular region. And uh, I find that, frankly, really shocking. That is more disturbing to me, I guess, in a sense, that I guess you always uh, think that if somebody can twist the rules, they're going to, and, and in this case, uh, these people acted uh, in, in the most unscrupulous manner possible. But to say that you don't have normal financial procedures with the regular checks and balances in place, then that's an invitation to pillaging the public mm -hmm. uh, tr at, the, at the public uh, trough. So. Uh, that, that is a greater yeah. qu uh, problem, and I know you don't condone it. I, I yeah. would simply Look, like to know if we can get some regulatory action uh, mm -hmm. in place sooner mm -hmm. rather than later when it takes so long to get some legislation through. Congresswoman, I hope my previous remarks were, should not be interpreted to say that I don't think we have audit and controls in place. I, I think, think you're, you're I, I think excuse we, me, your comments plus Mr. Keating's plus the IG's account uh, have led, led us to that conclusion. Okay. It wasn't let, just what you okay. said. Let, I mean, let, me, it's the let me clarify. Fact on, of the matter. On the specific instant problem in Passaic with the multiple salaries, it is true that we did not have a specific control that would automatically identify that. That is true. And we, are t we have taken steps to remedy that, on specifically on that issue. The system we have within the department to monitor the 3,115 agencies across the country, by the nature of, of resources we have, is risk management oriented. What we try best to do is to identify, based upon the individual, the independent public accountant audits, the IG audits, resident complaints, which, by the way, under Secretary Kemp, we're giving much more concern and interest to than previously. <coughs> uh, through the condition of the units in a housing authority, we are trying to identify those public housing agencies that we should spend greater time at. Now, as that system is found to be defective, and this was certainly a defect, we need to move quickly, and we have, to remedy that problem. But we, there is a system in place overall to look at generally the performance of a housing agency. To, to the point of your concern of, of New Jersey, the strike force, and, and it, perhaps it's, uh, it, it simply represents what happens when you get involved in this. As we got involved in the Passaic issue situation, there were more people who were calling us and talking with us about other housing authorities in New Jersey. Uh, per Thamboy, there were a number of newspaper reports that preceded the Passaic situation. We are nationally looking at this specific instant problem, and we will try to uncover other, if there are other, any instances of this. After the strike force completes its work, then, then I think it is definitely time for us to revisit what we find in that, not just on this issue, which I think we have covered this issue prospectively, but do we have any kind of systemic problem with housing authorities and their internal controls? And if we do, based upon the results of the findings of the strike force, We'll certainly be prepared to take this on as a national issue if that's what the strike force report indicates. Yeah. Uh, Congresswoman, if I may, put, again, postscript what Mr. Janice said about what Secretary Kemp did here. On the 19th of January, the Inspector General issued uh, his report, which we all have reviewed. The following Monday, the next Monday, the 22nd, uh, issues of suspension and limited denial or letter, excuse me, of suspension and limited denial of, of participation were issued to nine individuals. 
A week later, after meeting with the officials of the Housing Authority, the Secretary concluded that they were not going to be responsive and the Secretary under law needed to take the authority over. It was at that time, looking at the situation at Passaic, that he ordered the creation of a strike force to look at not only Passaic, but other New Jersey authorities because of these numbers of phone calls and allegations that were made. At the same time, he prepared a, a memo to, to uh, the Inspector General requesting that this be broadened nationally uh, immediately and that it look at two things. That first, the Inspector General reform his audit plan to include these things in his audit plan. And then secondly, that he contact each of his regional inspectors general, have them t contact our field office managers, regional administrators, and housing directors to determine if there are similarly situated problem public housing agencies. So your request has been followed up, and we are in the process now of expanding this nationally. Well, thank you very much. That is, that is comforting, but it's not going to be an audit limited to the CAP program. Is That's that correct? correct? It is expanded. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that clarification. But I am concerned about the systemic questions, and I think they relate also to the chairman's concerns about the competitive bidding, whether it be on legal services or architectural uh, uh, contracts. Uh, this, this has the potential for being much greater, and it, call, it argues, I think, in terms of uh, if you want to call it control or decontrol or whatever you want to call it, I call it good financial management. I, I would like to remind this committee and, and those at the table here that uh, one of the things that was uncovered by the HUD uh, hearings by the chairman and his uh, subcommittee here is the fact that, that we didn't even have a simple thing like a financial control uh, finance officer in HUD, you know. Uh, and uh, then I will just conclude, Mr. Chairman, I know this has gone on for a long time, but uh, with a plea and uh, does not require a comment from anyone at the table unless they they want to comment but as you may remember one of my the conditions in my bill that was included in the HUD reform was a proposal to and in fact I think we not think I know we passed it out in this form with the IG being uh, insulated against political pressure by giving him a tenure of office for appointment for a particular period of time which would help him I believe do his job better mm -hmm. uh, and he would not be subject to political influence and could be more independent. Unfortunately uh, it was ruled uh, uh, to be in the jurisdiction of this committee and therefore it was uh, removed from the bill in conference and I would hope that uh, here again we have further evidence of the need to um, uh, modify and mm. uh, improve and strengthen the hand of the IGs. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much, Chairman. Congressman Rukema. Uh, Mr. Uh, Adams, uh, I want to commend you for uh, outlining for us the key areas in which your agency is now working. And what I would like to suggest is that. Uh, shortly after the, the mid-February break, uh, you return to us so we can explore those generic areas. Let me just say that, uh, apropos Congresswoman Rukama's uh, last set of comments, you indicate the, f the first and most pervasive problem department-wide is the lack of adequate internal controls and financial management systems. And that really is uh, sort of the, the basic mission that we hope the new team will will achieve. Uh, I uh, find several of your uh, brief descriptions somewhat provocative. In the single family mortgage insurance program, you are saying losses may extend into the billions of dollars. Would you care to put a figure on that at this stage, a ballpark? As I testified before, uh, Mr. Schumer and his uh, urgent financial uh, right. issues in the area, along with the Comptroller General, the most recent estimate of 1988 was something like $1.4 billion in losses in connection with the single family program. And in the Section 8 discretionary funding, uh, basic problem you find is that uh, there is no documentation with respect to the decisions that were made, yes. why some people got money and others didn't. That's the been addressed by the new Secretary and... Absolutely. Mm. On the coinsurance program, uh, you say some of the largest coinsurance lenders accounting for over 50% of the program have defaulted on mortgage loans of over $900 million. 
and the secretary cancel the program. Uh, you um, indicate that under government national mortgage associations defaulted issuer portfolio, there is a dramatic increase from 3.1 to 12.5 billion. Would you care to comment on that? That is the result primarily of the default of uh, three major lenders. One was New York Guardian, and I believe their default yes. was $6.9 billion, and two others in the approximate range of a billion dollars, and that was a mortgage investment uh, company and Gulf Coast, each having about a billion dollars in their defaulted portfolio. Now you're also suggesting that owners and agents of multifamily housing projects have been misusing and diverting project assets and income for years. Is there any ongoing program that addresses that issue? Yes, in fact, uh, Mr. Keating and I were just meeting yesterday to talk about the distressed uh, projects uh, situation, and we're taking a much more comprehensive look at that at the present time to identify additional projects. The Secretary has recently taken some actions with respect to one of the manager owners. Uh, that is also the subject of some litigation and appeal at this point, I believe. Now, under Title I property improvement and manufactured housing programs, you suggest that there has been a significant number of defaulted loan loans which will end up costing HUD over $500 million. But this program involves an inherent conflict of interest. Dealers are trying to sell goods and services, but are also originating loans for their customers. Portions of this program have been terminated. Um, are you satisfied that the portions that have been terminated solves the problem? They address our underlying concerns, and that is the conflict of interest where the person who is trying to sell the goods is also making the underwriting determination, the elimination of the deal originated loans. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Adams, I again want to commend you uh, and, uh, and look forward to having you and your staff uh, come back uh, to explore all of these in detail. Uh, shortly after our, our mid-February break, we will be dealing with the principles at the Passaic uh, uh, Public Housing Authority. And uh, before I thank all of you and uh, express my appreciation, I believe Congressman Schumer has a question. One question that I had left out that I wanted to ask, and that is, and I guess what we try to do when we find something as uh, <coughs> wild as this is grope for uh, potential limits or non-limits. And I don't, I guess this is better for Mr. Adams, although I don't know who asked it. One of the things we found throughout this scandal at HUD was that sort of the lack of concern at the top in the, uh, until Secretary Kemp came in, just infected the whole agency and almost turned, uh, turned, turned into dust just about every program. <clears throat> so the question I have is, this kind of multiple payment scheme is it more likely to exist in HUD than it would be in other federal agencies, Mr. Adams, I guess, with your knowledge, and I'm sure you keep up with your fellow IGs in one way or another. Has it existed in other agencies? And could well the fact that a signal went out from the top, we don't care, uh, have led to it happening here in HUD and not in other uh, federal agencies? First of all, Mr. Schumer, I have no knowledge of existing in other programs at this point. I'm sure my fellow IGs will be taking a look at if they have comparable programs to see if such a condition exists. You're correct. We share information and oversight. Right. Uh, and secondly, uh, we have nothing in the uh, audit well, to I indicate can, I'll, to... I'll take that statement as my own that, you know, that uh, under, uh, under Secretary Pierce, at the very least, a signal went out is housing isn't noble, building housing, the government shouldn't be in it, so do whatever you want, and that somehow or other infects this. I just asked Mr. Keating or Mr. Janice, have you heard of any other instances where there's this double, triple, quadruple paying in I other have, agencies? No, sir. Okay. Have not. And I, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Schumer, if I may say one please, thing. Please. The, uh, the, the reason the Secretary came to the Congress with a reform bill which was proposed to be statutory as opposed to just by regulation or by practice or by handbook was for the reasons you say, that when he's gone, he wants to make sure that there are institutions in place, systems in place, 
so that this kind of conduct cannot easily recur. Well, we would hope that it would never happen again because it's nothing short of outrageous. This is the kind of thing that makes people say, government is for the birds. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I want to thank all four of you yes, for, for very insightful testimony. This hearing is adjourned. concludes yesterday's hearing looking into the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Join us at 10 a.m. Eastern Time this morning when we'll bring you live coverage of a hearing to look at U.S. relations with China. After this short break, a discussion of reform in South Africa. From Washington, you're watching C-SPAN. Be sure to join us later today at noon Eastern Time when we'll bring you live...